Well, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon for those of you on the on the East Coast. We have a very special guest today for the uh, iSchool Colloquium series. Um, I'm I'm Zach Fisher Katz, assistant professor here at the iSchool, and I'm really excited to welcome uh, Dr. Maria Harrington. Dr. Harrington is an American information scientist and artist. Her research focuses on aesthetics and perceptual ambient array information science theory as it relates to reality and beauty found in natural environments. Uh, using augmented reality, virtual reality, GIS simulations, and new media art to explore the phenomena of human reactions. She is currently an assistant professor at the University of Central Florida, director of the Harrington Lab, and is consulted on projects using AR and VR of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. So if you could give, uh, give Dr. Harrington a warm welcome. And, um, we'll, and we'll save questions to the end and feel free to put them in the chat as we go along and I'll, I'll, I'll handle that at the end. So take it away. All right, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Special thanks to Devin who I met um, at SIGGRAPH last year. He came to my, my SIGGRAPH talk on virtual nature and we've been talking for a while about different concepts and research that I'm doing with virtual nature and data visualizations to really construct these digital twins of of the real world. And then I use these artifacts in informal education as well as STEM education. But theoretically, I am interested in, in beauty as information and how that triggers um, a response in the human of curiosity and behavior that is um, really regarded as, as seeking more information, learning about the environment. So the, the main question is how what is beauty and how do we construct beauty relative to reality um, and use that as an artifact, a digital media artifact that can be um, put into the hands of children everywhere to learn whatever they want about nature. And so today I have modified my SIGGRAPH talk um, to be around certain projects of, of using databases mainly GIS information databases and visualizing those. So I'm, I'm very interested in the information fidelity and the accuracy, which yields a high fidelity environment, graphical fidelity environment. I am at the University of Central Florida in the Nicholson School of Communication and Media in the Games and Interactive Media program. We have a PhD program, an MS program, an MA program, and a BA program. It has about 1,500 to 2,000 students just in the, in the program. So it's, it's a large group and it's very diverse um, and, and a really dynamic place to be. The Harrington Lab at UCF, um, I started this as a way to um, investigate using um, augmented reality and virtual reality to build these models of nature. We were a virtual lab. We used Amazon Web Services and Unreal Engine as well as um, different kinds of coding environments uh, to build these, these different projects. They were a, a very large multidisciplinary partnerships. The Arboretum uh, project had about 15 people across biology and also games. And then the Carnegie project, I worked with botanists and biologists, um, research curators at the museum to construct these environments. So the SIGGRAPH talk was about virtual nature, but the real story I think deals with information. So um, I'm an information scientist and also an artist. And so when we were building these environments, the photorealism became, was actually a byproduct of my method and my process. And when is information fidelity defined as accuracy and completeness and assurance important? That, that's the main question. And I think if we're dealing with digital twins, we want that to be based upon high quality information. So the models of nature that I'm building are based on data that has been vetted and approved by the domain experts. And when we need high information fidelity, that means it the simulation matches reality. We have data accuracy, we have context sensitivity, we have salience and semantics. That information fidelity requ requirement um, is really only important in areas where there's a high cost to poor decisions made from that display or that system. 
that is transmitting that information to the human. We don't care about the information fidelity when there's no poor cost. So this graph shows information fidelity um, across the horizontal axis from fantasy to reality. And then the vertical axis is the low cost of a poor decision based upon inaccurate information to a high cost of a poor decision that requires high information fidelity, right? That you, you need that in certain applications. So the idea for education is that we want accuracy and knowledge to be the outcome, the ultimate goal of anything we're developing, independent of the tools we're creating. And so um, when we want the output to be learning, which is accuracy and knowledge in the human, we should have high information fidelity. We should have a, a visualization or a multimodal transmission of the most accurate and complete data we have about the real world, right? And so games and art and story, we don't use those for learning. We don't need high accuracy and knowledge. They can be fantasy, right? You could use Avatar, for example, and it's entertaining, it looks real, but it's, it's photorealistic. That movie was photorealistic, but it was fantasy. But it was, the purpose was for entertainment, not learning. Whereas if you are training a heart surgeon in augmented reality or virtual reality, you want high information fidelity so that they learn how to do that operation and they are competent. There's no cost of poor decisions in that case. So, the idea was that I'm, I'm trying to build these models of the real world that are not for games and not for artistic purposes, but the, the outcome is to help improve the learning. But photorealism is, I found was an, out, was an outcome of the information fidelity in these um, systems and how I was building them. So a long time ago, some history, quick overview. Um, in, in 2003, I hacked Unreal Tournament to build my dissertation, which was the virtual trillion trail from the same techniques. And so the question is, what does a PhD in information science do? Who's also an artist, right? Um, I figured out how to take DEM terrain data, which is vector-based out of ESRI and turn it into a height map that Unreal needed to visualize a virtual terrain. So we had the the streams and we had the ponds and we had the, the hills and we had the valleys. And then, um, I mean, this was before Google Earth, right? So I was overwhelmed with how to create the complexity of nature, the, the trees. I, I remember sitting there thinking, could I use a 360 video? And I thought that would be weird because it wouldn't have the same usability you needed. Um, but I came upon a sign in the forest that said, Dr. Susan Kalis, long-term National Science Foundation plot study of native diversity, right? So I called her and she had the data for Pennsylvania, these Pennsylvania plants um, in an ESRI, in, in a database. And I was able to get the plant inventory and the density for those plants and then visualize them. So this is where it all started um, in that project. Fast forward to 2018, I'm at the University of Central Florida and we have an arboretum um, and they had a database of the plants. And um, the point here is that it's not a 360 video. It's not a fantasy game. It's not a point cloud. It's not your traditional GIS abstract you know, dots on a map. Um, it is basically these three dimensional botanically accurate models of the plants, the correct plants, and they are dispersed in the correct location based upon the densities. So this is now an artifact that can be used for virtual field trips or informal learning, um, biology, botany, ecology, education. Um, and, and it's a wonderful test bed because I can control all the factors in the research design that are connected to the artifact that I, I create. I can, I can change all sorts of factors and test the outcomes. At the same time, I was working with a colleague at the Carnegie Museum um, and he was very interested in bringing the dioramas to life. And so the AR Perpetual Garden was created to run on um, Apple 
Apple iPads and iPhones, as well as Google Android uh, phones. And we were able to run a study testing the informal learning gains in the museum, which I'll talk about later in the, in the lecture. But what's unique about this study is that we were able to create two different scenarios to reinforce a curator's narrative about the Pennsylvania forests. Uh, one scenario was a visualization of the woodland in balance and the other was out of balance. So two different data sets, you can flip between the two and the contrast in the context of the museum as well as outside is possible. So um, this was a really exciting project. The process for both of these, all, all, of, all of this work is um, an expanded iterative design process um, the user experience design process is typically over here in the right hand side where you build a prototype, you test it with users and stakeholders, you get feedback and you refine your prototype until you don't have any more errors and the usability is approved subjectively by the, the testers, right? I've expanded that to include the expert um, the, and the learner in this process and, and really everything starts with a scientific review. So we start with sourcing the content, the facts, the educational stories. We have the domain experts in the field, the botanists, biologists, the ecologists, vetting and improving, imp vetting and approving all of the facts and the data um, that is the source for the entire application design. The scientific domain expert review then gives us feedback to correct errors. And then this cycles iteratively until much like a publication process, you go through multiple edits in your document before you publish. We're doing that with the data. Um, the domain experts approve this and release it to the artists. And the game artists are creating these three-dimensional models using applications like Maya. Um, and, and these are three-dimensional like mini sculptures made out of polygons. Um, and then they are texturing the polygons with photographs. So it's like taking wallpaper and placing it on top of a metal sculpture to create these accurate models to the height and the width and the dimensions and the features of that plant. The artists are very skilled in visual um, creative activity, but they're not trained domain experts or botanists, right? So they are building these models and doing a purely aesthetic review to the best of their ability. But this process creates a co-design cycle where there's a scientific review that is a joint process between the artist and the botanist because there's always something the botanist sees that the artist didn't. And that this, this is a very collaborative process between the artist and the scientist until it is approved by the domain expert. And they are the ones who have the role to release it. Once those models are released, then the software designers start to build your typical UX process, right? It's a user-centered design process to get the application to work as efficiently and without friction as possible. Once the usability is smooth, then I take it into the field and use an IRB approved study to evaluate the learning gains. So we are using um, different pre-tests and post-tests, different um, rubrics to make sure that our grading criteria is, is consistent across conditions. And then we test it for the actual ultimate goal, which is the, the learning. And then that's the full, the full cycle for um, the, the ELEX process. So we use that process. So where we start, is um, in the field with students. We actually, um, this is the older technique before the photogrammetry technique, um, which can still be done, but we photograph the objects in the field. We um, take measurements of the plants. We actually deconstruct the plants to get the textures we need. And we create, um, we actually created a three-dimensional plant atlas. So each model out there, I'll try to go out to the model. There we go. What we have are these, um, these models that are three-dimensional and um, usable in, in different games and different um, systems, right? 
All right. Um, the domain experts are important because they are helping us identify all the information and uh, vet and approve all of them. This is John Wenzel at the Carnegie and Patrick Bolin. I have a lot of different um, students and collaborators in different departments, psychology, and um, also Salzburg helped a great deal. So when these models are corrected, and here's an example of John Wenzel uh, reviewing a plant model. With an out, and I have photos to support this, is that hemlocks fill the entire space. There's very little open air in a hemlock. And okay. The, the way they do this is at the top of the tree, the branches point up the way you have them, except there's no empty space. They fill it. And in the middle of the tree, they point horizontally. And at the bottom of the tree, they sag down. And I have some photos to show that. Um, now the spray of leaves is very horizontal as you have it there. Uh, it's okay. very flat, but the angle of the branches changes and they're dense enough that basically when you're on one side of a hemlock, you can't see through it. They fill everything. Okay. All right, so this went on for all the plants that we modeled. Point out and I have photos. And we resulted, it resulted in 35 plants that were um, supported by Epic Games to be launched on their on their marketplace. You can see that each of these models is lined up um, and then you can see how they are also positioned as, as a lineup. In the Northeast, we have 35 plants that were also released. Um, and these are the 35 plants and the 35 plant lineup. So we have 70 optimized AR VR plant models that are available and you can download them. Um, they, they've been totally optimized for any device. Um, and we've also included GIS data representing the plant population densities, which I'll talk about. So for each plant, and we have 35 in, in the Northeast and the Southeast, there is a corresponding plant field guide website. And this website gives you access to plant facts and concepts. It was also published on PBS Learning Media. So it's one application, but it serves multiple purposes. And this is your typical website, right? Um, the website held uh, the data for each plant. So if we go down to one of my very, very favorite ones is the, the fork blue curl. You can see that in a sense, it's an electronic field guide, right? There's an educational story. There's information about where it, it will live and which neighborhood its common name, its Latin name, and all of the gardening facts. So these facts are really the metadata, different soil types and different um, lighting conditions, and also the zone number um, for the US agricultural map. So we can now map them uh, to that database. So um, that, that's another story. Um, for the Arboretum, we had data in an ESRI map that shows um, every single community type over the entire campus area. And what you, you, you can see here is that each color is coded to a different community type name, right? So the um, dome swamp is this area seven that has a teal and, and green diagonal stripe. That area corresponds to the data in the database about which plant is in the dome swamp and the density of that area that's covered by that particular plant. So that was a bottom up visualization. A top down visualization, we had some drone images. So drones were flying over the arboretum and photographing it. And when we had a clean line of sight and we could see which individual plants were in what locations, we fused that into the, into the Unreal Engine visualization. So it's fusing that information. Here's an example of the different community types, the basin swamp, the bagel, the depression marsh, the dome swamp, across the 35 plants. So it's a matrix of, um, it's a sample of, of the common plants, but it's also demonstrating that there's some dispersion. So the pond cypress plant exists in many different communities um, in different percentages. 
in the dome swamp, 20% of that area, that circle area on the map would be covered by the, bon the pond cypress itself. So you can imagine a circle with 20% little dots on your typical GIS map, right? So this map you could have in the dome swamp area, a 20% coverage. All we've done is we've taken the model of the cypress tree that has been modeled to the scale to the correct height and the correct spread. And we have covered 30% of the Unreal Engine map level or 20% with that tree. All right, and what you see is actually, this is one model, but we've rotated it, slightly varied the height and the spread based upon the plant's natural variation to create the illusion that there are many different types of plants. And the reason we did that is so that we could conserve the um, graphical processing power as much as possible. We wanted to be smart about where we used the engine um, for fidelity. Again, whenever we could increase the information fidelity, like with the drone images over the, the pond, um, we could see where all of the lilies were in this photograph. So in the virtual model, we actually placed those lilies in those locations given the photograph, right? So the idea is that when we can have more specific information, we use it. But if we don't have it, we use the statistical extrapolation for that area by species, right? All right, so how did we automate this? We took the data and we used something called a foliage brush, which is a way of plugging in the data into Unreal Engine's um, editor. And we can literally paint out the different natural communities by the right plants and the right populations. And I'll show you in a second. This is what a game developer would see. They would have the inventory of plants loaded in a palette and they would have the brushes available to brush out the different environments. So an artist is not, you know, the typical process that the game development community uses is that an environmental artist will pick and actually individually place these or guess which plant goes in what location. Um, and if you are a botanist or an ecologist, you, you perceive these environments as total, as, as not real. They're, they're very, um, it's almost like trying to pass off Frankenstein as Brad Pitt or something, right? It's not real, it's not authentic. Um, here's another example of the end result of the, um, the brushes. This was automatic based upon the data. So this is a data visualization of, the nat of that, that environment with all these unique species that are native species. Um, Here's the, here's the example of the brush. I'll, I'll let this play for a little bit. So uh, what we've got here is our, we have a small test scene for demonstrations of uh, 100 by 100 meters, as you can see down here. Um, and if we go into a perspective view, this is that same uh, 100 meter by 100 meter test space. And we have a uh, foliage brush set to a size of 5,000 unreal units, which is a radius of 50 meters. So a diameter of 100 meters. Uh, if we take our pond cypress here, we have our density set to uh, 20%. So uh, a single click with a brush or a single stroke over a 100 meter by 100 meter area would give us about 20% coverage uh, of the tree. So in this case, 24. If we test it again, 23. Um, if we, we take that same idea and we apply it to a large test scene of 500 by 500 meters, and we can select our entire plant inventory, which has uh, data accurate uh, percentages set as far as density goes, and we can just paint on an entire environment with a single click and stroke. And then we can go down into that environment. all of our different uh, plant densities working together create this 
kind of believable and real environment. And if we were to take this data and change it to something inaccurate, um, for example, if we do the scene off and we take our pond cypress trees, which should have a density of 20%, and we make it something crazy like 90%. You paint that on, it doesn't even look close to right. Um, our believable scene has become something that looks artificial. Uh, definitely not something that you would walk around in and think it looks real. And the same can be said if we take that data and we go the other direction and set our Cypresses to something like half percent. So even with all of the other plants accurate, single change to the data, and it just looks like a completely different environment. So if we go back, clear out this accurate stuff we set our density back to the data value of 20 percent we can quickly paint on this environment and it instantly looks like something that you'd really see walking around in the uh, swamps of florida all right so the point is that for each plant it for each community there is a percent coverage of that area that can be added Either we're doing it manually, but it could be automatically set with um, different data APIs, right? We could we can automate this process to drive the data visualization of different environments in a geospatial representation. So that's that's the power of it. Um, it also means we can go back in time, right? We could use pollen records and, and generate the past, and we can use models to forecast into the future and generate forecasting model visualizations and have the past, present, and future scenarios available to play what ifs. I, I think that's what makes it so different than um, what people are currently doing, which is either art for fantasy and entertainment, which we don't care about, or it is um, automatic you know, 360 video and LIDAR, which can only capture the state of reality today at the point of capture, right? And so this is um, a way to, to simulate the perceptual um, reactions in human or to create an environment that is immersive and it creates a, um, a powerful visualization for exploration and decision support. So, uh, what we and Chris was a wonderful student. He um, was one of my students. So the other point is that with 35 plant models, we can quickly simulate, um, we have 10 different communities here. And it's not a new production effort. It's just the data that's different. You can see each area is very different in character and pattern and feeling. Um, we can also create these stamps, these three-dimensional dioramas that could be used um, in a variety of applications, right? And, and, and these, these dioramas can be tiled. You can create a geometry of three-dimensional tiles for augmented or, or mixed reality purposes. And that's why I think, um, you know, Perry Becker and landscape companies that are concerned with using native species for sustainability development are interested in this kind of um, technology. They can visualize the garden or the landscape before they actually build it. And, and with the same benefits that architects and builders do with man-made structures. Um, going back to the, um, the plant field guide. The metadata is important for people who want to start to think about connecting um, the data about each species to metadata for organization in ontologies and taxonomies to facilitate semantic and automatic programmatic interactions, right? So once you do this, you can start to see that this pond cypress has a zone of 7B to 11B, 
well, there are many different areas all of a sudden in the swath of the United States that we could start to model, right? Um, and so one goal is to expand my effort to the Pacific Northwest and the Southwest to complete this um, the sample, the plant sample for the United States to cover the, the entire zone map. And once I have samples that represent each area for each zone, um, it will be very, very easy to start to simulate all different areas in the, in the entire United States. So um, the paper published um, is available, it's open source, you can download it. It talks more in detail about my methods of visualizing the Arboretum. So you might want to get that. Um, and then here's an example of all the output devices these, these applications run in, definitely desktop. This is really wonderful to watch her use it. So, So there are 35 plants that you can select. So you can find and discover information about each of those. I love it. As soon as I saw this, I was like, I know where that They totally have those little flowers in there. <laughs> oh my gosh. Are they not selectable? I don't know. Yeah. All right, so she's um she's sweet. And then we have it working in VR, so the headset version, HTC Vive. So and we also have it connected to a treadmill for multimodal embodiment research. And then two new companies um, I'm working with. One is an omnidirectional treadmill company for full um, navigation and wayfinding, and then a mini dome company called Cube 4D for more immersive and museum displays. Um, here is the augmented reality app that I developed with the Carnegie. So it works outside and inside. Um, we did a study at the museum um, with the public, and this is adorable, the condition where people were using it. 47, 46. So that study gathered data about the importance of all the different features, the design features in the app that were correlated with learning gains. And what I found was that the, the story, the curator's story was the was positively correlated to actual learning gains, as well as the plant facts. So this makes sense because you need access to the facts to learn. The immersive properties and components of the data visualization and the bioacoustics that were ambient and spatial and the 3D flowers, all of these design features were correlated with story. So they were not directly correlated with actual learning, but they seem to enhance and, and amplify the um, facts and concepts embedded in the story with actual learning. What's really interesting, see, I use a pretest and a post-test with a curriculum that is consistent and identical across a control and an experimental for a tight internal validity of design. Most studies in the past for informal learning have only used a survey, which is perceived learning, your opinion. Right? How much do you think you learned? Well, everyone thinks they learned a lot. 
The only correlation for perceived learning, the survey, was ease of use and the flowers. All right, so this is an important finding, I think, um, for people who are interested in, in using immersive technologies like AR and VR to study learning gains for education, because we control the design of the system, right? Each design choice has to be deliberate and intentional. We need to know how the combination of all these features and factors in the development of our applications come together and impact our, our outcome that we're measuring, right? So this is something in, in um, digital media that I'm, I'm very interested in teaching to my graduate students and my undergraduate students that every decision they make in the design is a potential factor in your research. And how do we isolate them and, and measure them for impact and then use them intentionally for the types of outcomes we want. So this is more work, there's more work that I want to do in this area, especially with the emotional outcomes or enormous emotional um, you know, correlations between curiosity and desire to learn and um, beauty and calm and desire to share and desire to create that seem to be triggered by the immersive technology and not the control condition without the immersive technology. So there, there could be just a stronger emotional um, driver that could be useful for education in this, in this area. Um, my future research is basically going to be driven um, by, by creating new applications using Unreal 5 and reality capture, exploring photogrammetry techniques to enhance the photorealism, as well as the information fidelity. Um, I have another mega grant under review right now with um, the Burke Museum at the University of Washington as a collaborator and also the University of Arizona, Biosphere 2 team, and also Perry Becker, the, the landscape design company that's interested in using native species um, in different use cases. So they want to show how to create um, new development with native species um, as part of their design proposals. And then I have an NSF grant out. So we're using reality capture to create these very high polygon models. And you can see it's very different than going out into the field and photographing a deconstructed plant and then reconstructing it as a 3D model with textures. You basically take 500 to 1,000 photographs from every angle, you feed it into reality capture and the system automatically pulls it together. Um, it's not perfect. <laughs> there are rough edges, you have to trim, uh, you have to rework it, but it does take, it does shorten your production schedule quite a lot. Um, the other thing with Burke, they have a beautiful um, database Many of the plants in the entire Pacific Northwest from Alaska to Oregon out to Idaho are geotagged. And so this database, um, it would be a wonderful source and, and um, resource to start to integrate with virtual nature models and, and simulate where these plants live, combine that with a population data sets and create large um, visualizations. The other thought with, with the Burke Museum would be that Mount, um, Mount St. Helen shows, um, they've been studying that area since the, um, since the eruption. And so we have a temporal data set, spatial temporal data set to visualize over time, which would be really, really wonderful. Um, University of Arizona, and thank you, Devin, for making the contacts. Um, we would be able to, um, Sample, sample the Sonora Desert and build out uh, a sample of plants for this location and then possibly work with the supercomputing center um, to model and you know, actually visualize some of these models and simulations for the area. Right. And then Perry Becker, um, again, they, they are interested, they work for Disney and they are a landscape design company. They have many different um, use cases for industry, um, but they want our plants because they are native species and they want to be able to demonstrate to their clients um, how they could integrate 
um, the native species into their landscape design. So instead of um, using the generic, you know, plants that are available, um, like all the rose and the tulip, they could start to use things like the beauty berry and um, different plants that are that are native to that area. All right. So I, almost in conclusion, um, this idea of virtual nature is really a data visualization, a model, or a simulation. It represents accurate data of the terrain, the water, the soil, the plant inventory, and the plant population data sets and densities. It can be multimodal. We can have sounds. We can even have haptic feedback. Um, it's geospatial, and the navigation is interactive with the user uh, driven free choice. They can go anywhere off path or the, you know, in, in any direction they want. And the objects themselves can become interactive, right? So each object, because it's geometry in the game, can register an event and it can be semantic and self-expressing of what it is for programmatic interaction. And because it's data-based, we can visualize the past, the future, and different scenarios. Moving this research into digital twins would require real-time data-driven environment dynamics. So wind could be something that we could integrate with an Unreal Engine. So the trees at a hurricane are blowing faster than not. Uh, we can integrate information about um, rain. So if it's raining in that location, we could actually have rain, virtual rain, raining. Um, it's a fire habitat in central Florida. So there's a lot of interest in simulating how fire will move through an environment. We could do that too. Um, we could have Internet of Things capture and transmit data about the real world to drive the dynamics in the model. Powder Mill Nature Reserve, which is the Carnegie Museum's um, biological research station, has a long-term bird migration study. And they also tag the birds and they have radio uh, frequencies so they can track uh, where the birds are. And then just run scenarios for real-time decision support from that. So digital twins are really about a model, a simulation with real-time dynamic data that um, can be used for real-time decision support, right? Command control type environments. But why don't we have a command control center for the earth? I don't know. You know, if it was a spaceship, we would, but I guess not. Anyway, going back to this idea of information fidelity and how um, all of this fits into the end user goal, which is we really do need accuracy and knowledge as the output, the ultimate applications objective for the user. It's important when there's a high cost for poor decisions that really does require high information fidelity that matches reality in terms of data accuracy and context sensitivity with salience and semantics being carried through. And those are only important for applications um, that require um, learning and decision making. It's not really important if you're designing a game or some sort of entertainment or art piece, right? It could be fantasy or abstract. So truth is beauty and beauty is truth. That's my, that's what I believe. But thank you very much. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, I would love to hear from you and um, right now, if you want to ask any questions, we can we can certainly take them, and I'll I'll do my best to answer them. But thank you. Thank you, Maria. And uh, we have a whole bunch of questions in the chat already that I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll read here for you. All right. Um, so Devin had the first one. Uh, what best practices for collaboration have you discovered for overcoming communication barriers between developers and scientists? on these highly interdisciplinary projects? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> Big question. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, in my field, I'm, I'm really interested in developing these, these co-design methods, right? They, they're, um, let me pull back here. So what was, it's very organic. Um, the one thing I do to teach my students is that you really want to, first of all, form teams that have uh, shared interests. So there's something that you both care about. Shared values um, are very important. And then complementary skill sets. 
right? So programmers, artists, designers. Um, leading all of these activities, again, it was very organic. I found people who were um, excited about building these models and wanted to help, wanted to participate in some way. And then um, setting up the infrastructure. I mean, I, I've come out of industry. I have like 10 years of experience in industry running projects and being a project manager and a director. So I'm very comfortable in setting um, in creating projects and managing projects in an organized way. Um, you know, it's, it's making sure that everyone um, understands what their roles are, their responsibilities, the milestones, the activities, and, and just being a good project manager and communicator, right? About deadlines and, and um, resolving conflicts and talking, communicating. Um, I, I have to say that these projects were smooth, that there was no drama, there was no trauma. Everything just happened really, really well. The architecture, you know, the infrastructure I use, um, we built this on Amazon's web service. Back in 2016, I set up the environment. It was incredibly inexpensive. I mean, I was paying pennies for the data and um, it was just, it was a pretty easy system to set up an environment with roles and responsibilities and, and manage the team that way. Um, I think right now going forward, I would probably use, uh, I would love to use NVIDIA's Omniverse and try that for collaborative building because um, in, instead of your, your old checking, you're not checking code out and making changes and checking it back in and trying to resolve conflicts with other programmers. Everyone's working on the model at the same time, um, at least in theory. I, ha I haven't tried it yet, but I, that's my next step. And then um, certainly Amazon Web Services, as well as Microsoft Azure, have the environments on the cloud to support teamwork. But I talk a lot. I, I text my friends, um, my, my teammates. I, I, it's, it's just a, a lot of communication to clarify um, and resolve, you know, talk about questions and, and projects. So there's just a lot of, a lot of conversations that go on. That's all. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, Anne was asking, how long does the iterative design process take on average between designer and subject expert? <laughs> it depends. It, it depends. I think that, um, you know, looking at this video, this entire Zoom, Zoom is great. I, I love Zoom for collaboration. Um, so I think for, John was on, on, the, on the Zoom and so was Bonnie Isaac, who was the botanist at the Carnegie. We were on the Zoom call for maybe an hour and it took, um, we got through all 35 plants in one hour. So, that was, that was it for this set. Um, yeah, I would estimate the total, like if I had to do it again, it's one day in the field to probably capture, I would say four to five plant photos. Um, it probably takes an artist a day to make it you'd have a day for the review. So that, that would be the time it would take for a plant, three days for a plant. If that helps to give you, give you a ballpark. <laughs> you said the answer I expected, which was it depends, but um, yeah, it just seems like a tremendous amount of work. So I was just curious. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the variety of the plants, right, um, I mean, it, it depends upon the complexity, the geometric complexity. And so with the longleaf pine, we wanted samples of um, smaller, younger plants and, and larger plants, right? Uh, which we don't have here, but um, that was one example. Other models are much more, oh, here it is. Here's here, the younger ones and the, and the, the, the larger ones. Other plants were much more um, complex. So my student who did this, I think it was um, 
Catherine. Catherine is a character animation student and she, like they're, they're going to work for Disney, right? So look at the detail here on her model. I mean, she probably spent weeks on this. It was sort of a labor of love, a real artistic um, process. And then when, um, let's see, when Chrissy used the photogrammetry method, right? The, um, this took, I don't know, a few hours to get the 500 photographs and then a few minutes for reality capture to get this. And then the vet and re, like you, you vet this with a botanist, they'll say, of course, this is botanically accurate and it becomes an artistic process of cleaning it up. But you still, I think, need the botanist to identify the plant. So um, that knowledge is important and also to maybe discuss whether or not this is a, a, a representation of the typical plant itself. Because you could go out into the, into the field and find a non-typical plant, model it, and it wouldn't be, it might not be the right, the one you want in your model, right? So I, I still believe that um, even though the machine learning is getting really, really good, it was invaluable to learn to share that knowledge between the botanists and the biologists and the students. So all of my students walked into my office hearing that I was paying $15 an hour and they showed me portfolios of tanks and, sh and, sh and shields and rockets and aliens. They'd never seen a plant before in their life, right? They went out into the field and they started to build these models. Um, and within weeks, they had fallen in love with their plant, right? And the story here with this, this <laughs> saw palmetto, the student who worked on this, um, she was a Florida native from central Florida, from Orlando. And the original model looked like a box, right? It was vertical or horizontal, it was very um, artificial. And I kept telling her she had to go into the field and do sketches and I even made her do a negative space sketch. Focus on the negative space, understand the shape and the form and how the plant is growing and research. And about six weeks later, she came into my office completely wide-eyed. Professor Harrington, they're everywhere. They're behind you know, the Walmart. They're next to the garage. Where did they, they're everywhere. And it was her perceptual system that shifted. She didn't see the most common plant in Orlando, in central Florida, even though she was a Florida native until she had to build one that was correct and learn how to see it. And then it was everywhere. It was everywhere. She couldn't help but to see it. And it was just such a, an amazing study in how education should work because our students come into our classrooms without the knowledge. They don't even know what they don't know. They can't even perceive it. They don't have the knowledge to perceive the reality for that information. And then when they do learn, they then their perceptual system is changed by that long-term memory, that it's in their memory. And then they can perceive reality the way it is. So that is what I think is critical about this exercise um, for the students. It's learning to see the world. And um, so because I'm working with students, right? That's another factor. There's some students who were really productive. Um, Chris Jones, who did the demonstration at SIGGRAPH on the brush, um, his technique is phenomenal. He could probably make three plants um, a day where it took you know, another student six weeks to build one. So they're not yet professionals, but over time they become very good um, and, and very skilled. So it's, it's very interesting, um, very interesting. So, I hope I answered your question there. If they were professionals, they could probably do three plants a day.
Right. Yeah, I'm sure the more you do, the, the easier it gets. Um, more quickly you can go through it. Um, we're running out of time, but maybe we can get a, one or two more questions in here quickly. Um, Devin was wondering if you have plants on their own or is there animal insect life as well in these biome reconstructions? So we have, um, we have a bug closet. It's a museum at UCF. And we went <laughs> into the bug closet and we photographed um, some of the damsels and, and dragonflies and butterflies. And we were able to add those as artificial life, but it, it's, it's pretty, they're not driven by models. I mean, it's just, it's decorative, but they are the right, right insects at the right time. Um, we also have the, um, a bald eagle or two flying around. So we were able to get a bald eagle. Um, we have the, um, all the sounds are correct. Uh, we made sure that we got the right amphibians. Um, and, and the funny story is right before I released it to SIGGRAPH, I was doing a final audit and I asked my team, I said, I said to them, I said, is that, is that green frog sound really from Florida? Are you sure? And we checked it and, and they were like, oh no, it's from Ireland. And I said, no, you have to get rid of that <laughs> and find the right one that lives in Florida at this time. So that's the extent, but it could be more. It could be more. Um, and maybe one, one real quick last question from, um, let's see, from Veronica was asking, it would be interesting to see if this had applications to modeling invasive species. Yes. Has that been looked into? Yeah. The, um, the application out here, the AR Perpetual Garden, um, it demonstrates, well, this is a woodland out of balance visualization, which is a green briar compared to the woodland in balance with the native species. But you could add um, invasive species to a visualization and just flip with, between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, but if, if folks have other questions, uh, you can uh, direct them to uh, Dr. Harrington. Um, yeah, there we go. There's her contact information. So write that down. Uh, this recording, this is being recorded, so we'll also have that posted to our site, and I'll share it with uh, Maria as well. Um, so yeah, let's give uh, uh, Dr. Harrington a round of applause, and thank you so much for coming to visit the high school and University of Arizona. And um, I'm hoping those those cacti will be in your next uh, next project there, the Sonoran Desert Museum. That'll be very exciting. I do too. I'm hopeful. <laughs> we'll, we'll know soon. We'll know Great. soon. Great. Thank well, you thank so much. Yes, thank you. And have, have a good rest of your day and weekend, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.